Would you like to introduce yourself for me? Yep, thanks Claire. Hi everyone, um, good to see you here today virtually. I'm Stella Wisdom, I'm a digital curator working with contemporary British collections at the British Library um, and a fan of all things games in libraries. Excellent, really happy to have you with us today Stella, thank you. And I'll move on to Anne Jones now. Hi, I'm Anne. Um, I run Cards or Die Board Gaming. So I do all sorts of things. I do events uh, with board games all over Leeds, um, corporate training, all sorts, all sorts of different events with board games. Um, and also I've, I've created a rule book toolkit for people to use when they're creating their own games. So that's me. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Anne. And Anne's been doing four workshops for us on um, favourite games that she's been doing and taking us through the mechanics of game making um, and they've been recorded and they're on our playlist which we'll share in chat as well. Just a reminder this um, is also being recorded for you so you can watch it back as well and don't worry you won't be featured because it's a webinar today um, so you can hide a little bit and now I'm going to go on to Liz and she's going to introduce herself. Hi, hello, I'm, I'm Liz Cable. I work at Leeds Trinity University teaching digital and social media and transmedia. And for a long time, I've been a, a live role player and a writer and designer of immersive games. And I'm just now over the last uh, five years uh, beginning to uh, use them for learning. So I've created about 50 escape games specifically for learning purposes and a couple of commercial ones as well. Um, and this, I find this list of novels really inspiring. <laughs> I can't decide which one to make an escape game about. Um, so uh, looking forward to talking to you today. Thank you so much. And um, first question I've got for the panel is why have you agreed to get involved in this programme of events with us today? Um, who wants to go first? Stella? Yeah, I suppose I can do. Um, really, I, I suppose I've kind of run a couple of game jams myself and I'm super delighted when I see other libraries and archives and museums wanting to run jams. Um, so, so basically I want to see more of this. I think library and archive collections can be used in all sorts of exciting ways. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's totally my bag. Um, yep. <laughs> Fantastic reason. <laughs> Same here. Me and Rianne have been wanting to do a game show for absolutely ages. So when we um, found out about the BBC novels, we were like, yes, this is our chance. Um, and we really, really can't wait to see what everyone creates. Um, Anne, why did you get involved with? So um, I absolutely love and adore games. Um, and I also love books. In my previous incarnation, I was an English teacher. I was second in English at a secondary school. So the combination of books and games was like my perfect, my perfect kind of thing. I was like, this is for me. And I just, I can't wait to see what people come up with. I love seeing new games being created. It's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. It's so amazing to see how everyone's brains thinks completely different. You can put a challenge to some, like a group of people and it's all gonna be completely different. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. How about you, Liz? Um, I think that this here it's just my absolute passion um, and um, you know having done my first escape room what five years ago and then tried to create them I've learned quite a lot and I'm a teacher and it's another opportunity to help others build games and do something that's so creative and so much fun and so useful um, but perhaps skip ahead a little bit and not make some mistakes so that's why I was really pleased to do the webinar the other day and it's up on YouTube um, you know so that people can learn and they don't have to do the same things I did because there's nothing worse than realizing in the middle of a, a lockbox game that you got your flow wrong and the, the thing they need to open the box is inside the box they're trying to open and that has happened to me so if I can stop that embarrassment happening to the people then that's why I'm here. Yeah I, I we learned so much from your your talk the other day Liz so good absolutely brilliant. Now I know that Rianne is raring to ask the first question so go for it Rianne. Well actually we've got a question in the chat already from Dave and he's asked what do you think are the greatest challenges about making playable games inspired by books? Um, Anne, do you want to have a go first? Um, I think for me, the, the challenge is the same challenge in any game, isn't it? It's making a game that people want to play and that 
the theme doesn't completely dominate. I think sometimes you, you have an idea of a theme and you can get so sidetracked by that theme that your game doesn't play very well. So it's that balance, isn't it, of making sure that you're creating a game that's good and that stands alone as a good game, but that also incorporates whatever it is you want to explore, whether that's character or plot or setting or whatever elements you've taken from the novel, that they support your game rather than overwhelm it. I guess it's all about balance for me. Liz, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think um, one of the I think one of the issues is creating a story that sits well with the original game but maybe isn't the original game. Because if you just stick to the book, the book is a linear telling of a, a story. And what you want to do is allow with your game for people to enter that world and to be in the spirit of that world and have the essence of that world. And some of the, as I talk about some of the artifacts of that story, but allow people to explore it in a different way. Because if the author was making a game, they wouldn't just translate the board game, uh, translate the book into a board game. So I think it's about feeling free to take some poetic license around. I was going to completely agree with that. I think picking a secondary character or a lesser character, not the main character, and maybe um, having their point of view from the story being told via the game, or if a game involves a journey, maybe going on slightly different journeys. Um, I think, I think absolutely. I think it's taking a work, but then take picking up an aspect of it that's not explored fully in the book, and then you can roll with it with your game. So, I was thinking if you take one of the characters, I was thinking Elsinore, which is um, a retelling of Hamlet. Um, so this is by Golden Glitch Games, um, but it's a, it's a kind of time looping game, but it's from Ophelia's perspective and not Hamlet. So I completely agree with what Liz is saying saying there. And, and try not to make a game too dull or scholarly. In fact, some um, a researcher at Edinburgh University was saying this, they've been analysing how games can be used in research and used in the classroom. And they're saying, for, first and foremost, a game should be fun to play. Um, and if it's not fun to play, then you're kind of um, not really achieving your ob objective. So yeah, it's it's don't sacrifice the fun by, by trying to follow something too much. Um, and I think that leads on really nicely to our kind of next question about um, if we've got any kind of um, suggestions about any lit literary inspired games and how they kind of work to challenge the narratives of the original stories or different perspectives. Um, and if you, yeah, so if you've got any suggestions about any good literary games, Liz, do you want to start if you've got any? Oh, well, my, my favourite novel from the list is Pride and Prejudice. And there's rather a nice card game called Marrying Mr. Darcy, where you have to, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a female player, you have to um, improve your etiquette. You have to become accomplished. You have to be able to talk and to gossip, and you you earn, you know, you sort of build up in your your reputation. I forget the exact uh, scores, um, but the idea isn't actually to marry Mr. Darcy. That's one of your options. The idea is to marry the best person in the game for you, and you can win in various different couple combinations. And it's just quite good fun to play. But that also brings in the kind of historical aspect, doesn't it? And brings it into the world of Jane Austen. And I like that idea that you could choose a different, maybe Darcy isn't the best choice out of the story. And you have all these different options. Um, and do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that's um, one that I like, which I happen to have here, is um, Agatha Christie's Death on the Cards. And I love this because basically um, some of you are trying to um, work out who the murderer is and one of you is the murderer. So it's kind of a bit of a bluff game. But also it's just got like loads of little quotes from the novels and that it, it uses all lots of characters from lots of different novels and kind of smooshes them together. But it's got that real Agatha Christie tone to it. And with all the quotes and things, it's just really lovely. Yeah, so I really like that one. I know you've already given us one, Stella, but do you have any others? Um, I was going to mention Inkle's 80 
80 days, which is kind of retelling of, of Jules, Jules Verne's um, Around the World in 80 Days. So this is by Inkle, a small game studio in, in Cambridge. But I just kind of kind of love it. You, um, There's so many different things. You can buy and sell things at the market. You have conversations with people you meet. Um, if you don't look after Phileas Fogg, so you play um, Passepartout, so you're, you're the kind of manservant. But if you don't like trim his moustache regularly, you kind of start lo losing points. It's great. It's it's um, available on PC, but also smartphone. And um, I actually play it on my Kindle. Um, so yeah, it's um, I, j I just really love that work. And I just wanted to give that a shout out because it's very accessible. Um, even with people who say to me, oh, I don't play video games. Um, I, th I think it's so easy because it feels like part book, part game. It's kind of hard to define what that work is. But I know, I don't think Around the World in 80 Days is on the, is on the BBC list though. I checked, it isn't, is it? Um, I was I was going to give a shout out also to Terry Pratchett and Discworld because um, there, are, there are several Discworld games which I've not played, but the Terry Pratchett archive is in Senate House Library at University of London. And they've actually got the, the video games as part of the archive and they're looking at how they can digitally preserve them um so so uh, terry pratchett was kind of ahead of his time in kind of working with game developers and turning his his novels in into games very kind of early on and so i think it's very important that they are being kept for the future and uh, um that's a fantastic link into my next question. Um, so do you work with library collections or artists to create games and new content? Um, and have you been inspired to create a game after researching an archive? Um, I'll leave straight back on to Stella if that is okay. Yeah. Um... So I work at the British Library, um, which is a vast collection of all types of things from stamps to sound recordings, scrolls, um, you name it, we can probably find it. Um, several years ago, there was a bit of kind of uncertainty about whether game designers would want to use our collections. And I think that's because a survey had been done, this is over 10 years ago, of would games companies come and use our reading rooms? And there was a bit of a finding of maybe they wouldn't, but they hadn't asked the questions of would they use digitized record digitized collections available online so I think I think the right questions weren't asked in that survey back then um, I started experimenting with with making digital collections available to game designers because um, I went to a conference about digital preservation I met um, Professor James Newman who's at Bath Spa University and Ian Simons um, who runs the National Video Game Museum in Sheffield which I believe is reopening up so if people find themselves in Sheffield do get yourself down there they said to me we run a competition for students but it doesn't really have a focus could the British Library collaborate with us and we could um, use your digital collections um, and see if they work for a student competition so that's how I started experimenting with how um, basically the British Library's digital collections could be used to make games I had no expectations when I started that project, um, but but I thought there's nothing to lose in trying, um, and it exceeded my expectations. In fact, it just kind of opened my eyes and seeing some of the works that the students made and submitted, they looked so professional. I couldn't believe that they were student projects and not been and hadn't been made by kind of professional games companies. So, yeah, it it, it kind of opened my eyes, and that's what kind of set me off using our collections in that way. Excellent. Um, we've got such a wealth, haven't we, in libraries of images, heritage, all sorts of things. And Rianne did a fantastic talk last week, um, all about behind the books on the BBC novels and linking um, real life stories and history into our collections. And that's again on our playlist. So please do have a little look at that. And there's also a Flickr um, account. Um, that's linked to our BBC novels list as well, um, that Ariane's created four themes from, well, that's beautiful images in there. So Anne, have you ever been inspired to create a game from archives that you've seen or resources, or have you seen any? Um, I've only, I've only created um, a couple of games really, um, and they've been more uh, for corporate training, so they've been more to do with um, you know, going into someone's workplace and them telling me what, what they wanted people to learn and me building a game that would teach that. So I did one in um, like social prescribing, for instance, but no, I've never done that. And I think it'd be really fascinating because I love looking at all like 
when Leeds Library share stuff on Twitter or, you know, you can go down quite a little rabbit hole, can't you, looking at all the images and kind of reading around them. I love all that, but yeah, it's maybe on my to-do list. <laughs> Liz, what about yourself? Have you created games? Yeah, I'm just thinking of a couple of things. I think, was it a couple of summers ago, all the libraries were doing, the, they do this big read project over the summer, don't they? And the theme was um, Dennis the Menace and the Beano. And so we, we made games and puzzles based around, you know, Dennis and Nasha and Minnie the Minx and all of that. And it was just wonderful. Uh, tree houses and catapults. And I'd never done anything like that before. So, and I don't think that's how people think of archives, you know, comic archives, but but they are as well. And then the other one I did, I was uh, teaching some librarians how to make escape games to the library. And the emphasis was on the local history collections. So I made a game using uh, different periods of maps. We had family trees um, and it was called The Last Lamplighter. And it was how, um, and you had to follow the lamplighter around the maps, you know, um, lighting all the lamps and then putting them out again. Um, and, and I felt I was really um, in contact with the history of the place by, by designing a game. And I think that's another thing, designing the games can be as educational, if not more so than, uh, than playing them um but you do have to as i keep saying you know uh, keep the element of fun in it if it gets too dry and too educational um you know people won't enjoy it so it must be fun but i i was hoping to use it the the archives a lot more um and now everything's been digitized I'm, i must confess i often i often use things that i find um in the digitized collections online i know other game makers have done the same I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think putting digital content up on platforms like Flickr, so you've mentioned Flickr, it, it's you can't always expect to, people to find digital collections on your own website. So I, th I think using using platforms like Flickr, like Wikimedia Commons, it's kind of making content available where people are, people like Liz are going to find it um, and, and use it and promote it to students. I think that's super important. I was also going to say sounds as well. So institutions that have sound archives. Um, I learned early on that that um, sometimes it was easier for people to break sound copyright easier than image copyright. Um, and when I first ran my student competition, the students broke sounds copyright and I, I learned a big lesson. Um, they, they used um, some mainstream recordings from film soundtracks and I was worried they were gonna get sued by Warner Brothers or something like that. So um, where I work, because we've got a sound archive collection, I had a chat with some of my curators there and we started making sounds. Um, and actually we, we, last year we commissioned a work using using wildlife sounds I'll put I'll put a link into the chat so so think, thinking of sounds as well as images is quite quite nice it's an interactive woodland if anyone's wondering what I'm on about it's called um, faint faint signals by invisible flock Yorkshire based studio so so just wanted to give them a shout out Absolutely love Invisible Flock. I've been stalking them for years and I love um, the social media from British Library from your sound archives and then you sometimes you make a little gif with it from the collection images. Um, so I think we have got a question in chat about the intellectual property of the books um, affecting public release of the games. Um, so I think everything that we put up is out of copyright on our Flickr. Um, so you do need to double check with that, but you can get in touch with the libraries um, and the, you know, the sources and, and ask them kind of thing. I was wondering whether that question might have been about the actual books themselves on the list. So um, it's quite an interesting question. So we've seen kind of um, books like Agatha Christie and so how do game makers get around having such close connections? Do they have to get the rights from the books themselves and the publishers? I'm not sure if anyone knows. I must admit when I've been planning projects I've picked out of copyright works to make it so so when I was doing my off the map competition and other things I've safely um, picked out of copyright works. I guess it would depend on how much you're lifting from the actual book and whether something could even be considered a parody so you do have kind of parody and exceptions law um, 
um, what's the word I'm after, um, exceptions to copyright. So if you're doing something that's very much a comical parody, even if something was in copyright, you might be able to, it might be allowable as a, as a kind of a, a parody. Um, I would just urge caution if a work is in copyright and um, you don't really want an author's estate to sue you. Um, if something is in copyright and especially if the writer's alive or you can contact their literary estate, um, it, it's worth checking with them. They might be delighted and they might want to collaborate with you and then promote your work if they think it celebrates or they might not. Um, but, but all I can say is if, if, if a work is still in, in in copyright and you're doing something that's very closely related then check with the estate or check with the living writer um some writers are up for it ben aranovich of rivers of london he's working working with a games company for a role-playing game um, i know some of the writers working on adapting his novels at the moment so so his rivers of london books are being turned into a role-playing game by um I think it's Chaos Inc. I can put the link in the chat. So, so some writers want their want their works and, and actively seek companies to collaborate with. Um, but if if you're starting off yourself, then yeah, um, either stay to play it totally safe, pick something totally out of copyright. Yeah, I think it's always a, a minefield copyright. So I think uh, with the Games Jam, we're just thinking of kind of educational and it's a a bit of fun. But if you wanted to actually develop it as a you know, and sell your game, then check all that kind of copyright issues first, I think. Um, but I'm just going to move on to kind of what resources and toolkits can people use to create their games, whether it's an online game or a physical game, um, what can people use to actually get started? Um, Liz, do you want to start with that one? Um, in terms of creating an escape game from a standing start, there's a website called teamescapes.com. Um, I'll put a link in in a minute when I'm not talking um, and that um, has a, a lock that you can use online and then you can also upload all of the kit for your game and there's some games that you can download and play for free that are up there already there's a, a community creating games and you can create them yourself as well but it's all completely uh, it's print and play so you, you you design your game so it prints out and then people cut things out and move things together and then they actually open the locks um, on open the locks online and, and get more information information when they've opened the locks. I also make a lot of games that run completely online and doing things like creating fake text message sites and fake tweet sites, that sort of thing. So you can have the Queen or a Barack Obama or someone congratulating you on uh, on uh, completing the game, they'll send you a text or what have you. Um, and also you can have phone messages as well. So there's sites you can go to online where you type in a script and the queen's voice will then read it out for you. There's all sorts of fun things for many hours, uh, Googling and making games online. Um, and do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, um, so for me, the biggest source for that is is my like on Twitter. There's a big community of board gamers on there, and a lot of them share. Like, um, I retweeted something by Carla Cop from Weird Giraffe Games the other day, and she often does blogs about her experience of designing games and the process of it. And also, people are very up for like chatting about the process and chatting about you know ideas. There's an awful lot goes on of people sharing like, you know, I'm thinking these cards are finished and they'll share an image of the card and they're like, what do you think? And some people are like, oh, the font's a bit small or oh, I don't like that colour on that background. And you get some really, really good feedback and you can develop some really nice relationships on there with, with other board gamers. Um, so that would be my first port of call, I think. There's also quite a lot of Facebook groups that do similar thing. So I'm a member of, um, there's board game broads there's analog gamer girls there's a few there's a few groups where people will share their progress and also where they'll look for like play testers and groups of people who can play with with them and test the game out you know and um, I've also I mentioned at the start created the rule book toolkit um, and that takes you through the whole process really of of creating your rule book and that also has some information in about testing and, and the different iterations of building your game and thinking about things like consistency, inclusivity. Um, so I'll share a link for that, but that's um, that's a useful, a useful kit really. It's like more than 13 hours worth of work for you to do. <laughs> you don't have to do it all at once, obviously, but yeah, it's, it's useful. So. 
it's quite a lot about the pitfalls, isn't there? What um, people sometimes put in their toolkits and what puts people off. And <laughs> it's a good resource. Um, Stella, do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I, I'm mostly interested in, I suppose, online open source um, platforms where you, where you can write interactive fiction or make, um, make small games, where especially where you don't need any previous knowledge of, of coding or programming, something that people can, it's very user friendly and you can just get started. So I was going to mention um, Twine and Bitsy and Scratch. Um, and one of my colleagues has written a blog post, basically listing, listing some of these online interactive fiction writing tools and going through them with the pros and cons. So I've just put a link in the chat there. Um, Bitsy is pretty fun. It makes very retro looking games. Um, um, and we've actually got a virtual British library in Bitsy form. Um, I can put a, li a link in that. During lockdown, the first lockdown last year, we were missing the library. So we built um, a miniature Bitsy British library for people to come and um, virtually explore, which was a lot of fun. Um, Twine's very good to get going, um, but also Scratch. Um, my colleague um, Cheryl Tip is the library's wildlife curator, and she made um, a flappy back game last Halloween. Again, during lockdown, it's it's. Um, I'm not saying that curators at the British Library spent lockdowns making games, but some of them made a few. Um, I think what we were thinking is if we want to encourage other people to start making some, maybe we should have a go ourselves. I'll put a link. Flappy back is 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 quite a straightforward game. You have to to um, try to flap your bats um, through. I am really terrible at it. Um, I <laughs> it's, um, so lots. There's lots and lots of things like that out there actually. Um, and again, we're talking about talking to other um, creatives, um, meetup groups, um, and many of meetup groups that I used to go and meet physical meetup groups in person but many of them have been running online um, and there's an Oxford and London interactive fiction kind of writers meetup group but it's all online at the moment so it doesn't matter where you are you can be in Yorkshire you could be in Greenland you could be anywhere in the world um, and they've been having some great great sessions um, some of them where they've had kind of makers of works come and demo their games um, and or playing through a list of games so so basically yeah seek out other makers um when it's safe to do so in person that's lovely but there's loads of these sorts of events running online and it's it's just kind of really really wonderful really and i think it's fine for people just to spend lockdown making games for other people i think that's what we all should be doing i mean <laughs> um so that brings me on to um have you found any new methods of enjoying games during lockdown? How about yourself, Anne? Uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm really not very technical. So um, all the kind of the move to doing stuff on like there's tabletop simulator and there's um, there's a few online platforms that people use and I'm sure they're great, but I'm not. I just I'm not very technical I'm very much one of the things I like about board games is the tactile nature of them and that's that's what I very much like so um I did sessions where we literally played the actual board game so I did like I had a camera facing down on the board and then another camera on me or whoever me and my partner or whatever and we played with other people um and I ran um we played pandemic which is a cooperative game uh, very appropriate didn't really know how many people would want to play that but it was quite popular um something quite satisfying I think because in pandemic you have to beat the virus and you have to cure everything and it so it's quite satisfying in that sense um, and we played other cooperative games and one that we played quite a bit weirdly was Scrabble <laughs> with which is obviously not cooperative but we played with another couple and we used um so that we had enough pieces and so that we could look at the tiles we used bananagrams tiles for their for their tiles and scrabble tiles for us so we had like a camera pointing at each of our boards and then a camera pointing at ourselves and that was really fun because we didn't realize as well we doubled the amount of tiles available so it was in the end usually in Scrabble you run out of tiles don't you we were like I've run out of board space I have to do a two-letter word because there's no room on the board so it was dead chaotic but really good fun and for me that was more fun than playing something on a, on a simulator site but um yeah so that's that's how I got around it and of course like I'm sure everybody did lots of quiz games 
so many quiz games like I know that people have reached saturation point I think with those but there's so many different ones out there and um, big potato games do some really quirky odd ones and there's a Leeds couple that designed a game just before lockdown I think called shot in the dark and I love that it's really good fun and it's nice because it's a Leeds couple as well so um so that's been good fun yeah so yeah Love that I love that you still can still get hands on even though you can't be in the same space with someone and I think that's quite an important part of but like tabletop games really and um, so it's clever that you've been able to still do that even digitally I think how about yourself Liz have you been exploring any more any new methods of playing? Oh, I've been playing escape rooms all over the world. One of the fantastic results of lockdown has been people moving their games online. So there's someone in the room who has a camera and who acts as your avatar inside the game. And so my family has been getting together um, online on Zoom and then playing these escape rooms on online. Um, another one we've been playing quite a lot of, I just put a link in the, in the chat, is uh, Bring Your Own Book. Um, which is one of our favourite games to play. Uh, and you can have as many people playing it as you want as well. Um, and all you need to do is bring a book and it's about choosing phrases that match the cards. So it might say dialogue in an action movie and you all have to find the relevant dialogue in an action movie inside your book, which might be a physics textbook. You know, it could be anything. Um, and it's great fun, lots of hilarity, easy to play. And as many family members as turn up can play it. So it's quite useful from that point of view as well. Should I follow on from that? I, lo I love that last suggestion and it links into what I was going to say. So um, one of my favorite things has been a friend's, um, a friend was organizing a birthday party for her little girl. Um, this was in the first lockdown and the, and the little girl was quite upset because obviously her birthday was, she wasn't able to have a real birthday party. So we used whatsapp to play a game of snap but not with cards where people had to suggest an object so that this was a big group chat in whatsapp and i think it was called what snap i don't know whether anyone else has played this this was the first time i played and you literally had to go running around your house finding the object that the, the person who'd won the last round had suggested um, and it's it, so very very simple concept so if you won around you then suggest whatever random object and you and it was whoever found it first and posted a picture in in the whatsapp chat to prove that they'd found it first and then they could pick the other object um, i quickly learned that i was at a disadvantage so i don't have any children myself so people who were suggesting all sorts of items that maybe people who've got young children will have were finding this super easy like i don't know fluffy pipe cleaners or crayons and i'm thinking i don't have any crayons don't have any pipe. this is a shame i was thinking i need to do more crafts myself um, but it was such a simple concept and it really felt like a a child's party game um, and it meant that family members and friends who were dispersed all over the place we, we could we could play this together using whatsapp on our phones and i just thought it was a really lovely simple concept um yeah really liked it you were so creative i was gonna say annie you must tell us about the birthday party you did <laughs> that was exactly what i was gonna say i did a child's birthday party on zoom it was hilarious because <laughs> I didn't I didn't know if it was going to work, but it did. It did work. But we played. So first of all, we played bingo and he wanted a Halloween party, obviously, because it's April. And why wouldn't you have a Halloween party in April? So we had a Halloween party, which was awesome. And um, so we did Halloween bingo where I wrote down the names of the things and they had a grid. And then we did um, we played a kind of version of Beetle. Um, you know, where you roll the dice and you draw the beetle, really old fashioned kids game. So, but we played cat, we played witch's cat. So um, I, I sent them a template for a dice because of course not everybody has them at home, do they? But anyway, so they roll, someone in the family rolled the die and the other family members had to draw a cat when they shouted out the numbers for the parts of the cat. And it was like a race. And then the first person to finish their cat held their cat up and shouted witch's cat. It was the most chaotic thing. And then I played, um, I don't know if you've played this at real parties, but Corners. I was just, I've written down your snap idea because I think that would have been awesome. But we played Corners and so I sent them four images. And the idea is you normally in a big 
room when you play this with kids you put an image on each in each corner so there was like witch broom cat zombie or whatever and then the children run around run around run around and then when you shout corners they all go and stand by a picture and then you're supposed to hide your eyes and call out a corner like witches and then everyone who stood by the witch is out so then you go again and again and again and eventually what you do is you say last one this time if I shout out where you are you win so you get a small group of winners so you just play it till they get bored and a bit tired usually so I thought oh we'll try it and it was really funny because they were obviously all in like they were in their own living room just running round and round <laughs> I thought and then I was like that's the end of that have a lovely afternoon I thought their parents will be like why is she wound them up into a frenzy <laughs> but yeah so you can do all sorts with a bit of thought can't you I think yeah I'm just going to jump to another question I think it links in quite well about the kind of social aspects of gaming and whether you've worked with particular groups where certain games have um, brought out kind of social interactions or um, yeah so maybe different groups or different kind of learning um, Liz do you want to start with that? Yeah, I just want to say one of the one of the games I do um, is called The Locked Box and it's all it's a Sherlock Holmes game to introduce uh, the golden age of detective fiction to English students. Um, and we used to do it sort of halfway through the second semester. That was where we started doing it. And after the first time we ran it, we realised it encouraged such discussion because it's an escape game murder mystery. It just the volume goes up in the room whenever students are playing a game and particularly an escape game or a puzzle based game. And we actually made it one of the goals of the game was to raise the level of discussion so that future lessons afterwards, the students are used to talking at that level. And so we moved it to like the second or third um, lesson of the semester so that the students would play it quite early on when they were getting to know each other and then that level of dialogue and that level of noise and participation would then carry on through the term so very definitely one of the things that attracted me to escape rooms and escape games very early on was how especially if you're doing icebreakers I've written a chapter about this somewhere you know icebreakers are often based on who can tell the most embarrassing story or or be the wittiest or the cleverest in the moment whereas in fact if you give people a task to do together then the introductions will follow naturally and it's much easier and for someone like me and, and others who are you know a little bit socially awkward I'd far rather have a task then, you know, have that creeping doom of they're going to ask me a question and it's going to come to, to me in a minute. So, um, yeah, I think that that sort of social rapport building is a really important part of these types of games. Oh, I'm one of those people who absolutely dreads icebreakers. And I'm so worried about them coming to me that I don't remember anyone else's name or anything else anyone has said. I'd much prefer to do something a bit more collaborative. Um, but Stella, do you have any kind of examples? I was just going to say on the very first day I met Liz, she invited me to an escape game that day. And it, it was the first day I met Liz. We were complete strangers. I'd arrived at Bath Spa University campus for a conference. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was a nice day. I think I'd gone into either a common room or a kitchen. We were staying in halls of residence and, and Liz was like, I'm going to an escape day game. Anyone wants to join me? And, I, and we were all a bit like, what's that? And so, uh, so this is like, don't worry, it'll be fun. So you made the ice boat breaker happen and it was brilliant. A group of us went and did an escape game, which actually wasn't very good. Um, I forgotten the name of it now it wasn't a very good one but it was a brilliant icebreaker and I had such a fun time and it, it made me understand the concept of them so I'm always grateful to that experience it, it, it was it was wonderful for my example though I'm going to use Minecraft actually and um, so I've, I've done a project with Lancaster University um, where they've been basically building literary environments from famous books in Minecraft and calling it Litcraft um, it's, it's been brilliant and then using it in, with all, in all sorts of um, settings and organisations but we worked with a, a local school in Camden at the British Library and the children would come in one afternoon a week I think we did for 12 weeks and they were children that were reluctant learners reluctant readers um, 
we actually got the children making their own games in LitCraft for a younger age group. So we that we um, gave them some examples, but over the over the twelve weeks, they actually had to make some activities and make some worlds for younger children to explore. Um, and the children really engaged and really loved it. And I think they liked the fact. I think they made them feel a bit more grown up because they were making a learning resource for a younger age group. And it was just wonderful to see. So these these were children that maybe didn't normally always enjoy school or enjoy learning um, and they and they really opened up and blossomed um, we also had a map session so my colleague Tom Harper who's our antiquarian maps curator he did this wonderful session again treating them like adults and he brought some amazing antiquarian maps out and showed the children and it, it was just it was just really really wonderful and, and they did enjoy it and they asked Tom lots of questions and then Tom came back on the last week and they and the children showed Tom the games that they'd made so it was a really nice so earlier on at the start of the program they'd seen the maps and Tom had explained and then the children were explaining what they'd done to, to library staff at the end it, it was just it was just a really really nice program I think we were quite inspired with that we did um, a lit craft event um, based on Treasure Island um, and I bought these 18th century pirate books and showed the kids and then they created their own pirate characters and we had maps and things as well so that Minecraft was the real hook because they all I mean I couldn't play it at all but they just picked it up doing it and then it's almost by stealth bringing in these other examples and of course showing them real life pirates it was it was great but yeah so it's nice how we can spread those kind of learning and those kind of programs across the country really um, and do you have any examples of different groups you've worked with or where games have worked really well yeah, definitely I was just I like to comment about stealth because when I was teaching I was used to quite like a bit of learning by stealth so you'd say things like we're not going to do any writing and then about halfway through the lesson you kind of go oh, you might want to make a note of this and because you started by saying we're not going to do any writing they're like oh I'll write that down it might be important do you know that kind of bit sneaky but really engage yeah there's I used to do love doing odd things with them or like there was a poem that was um banned it was taken out of the anthology and um, we used to, um, I used to deliberately give out half the old anthologies that had the poem in and then half the new anthologies that just said this page deliberately left blank. And I used to always just say to them when they were like, I'd say turn to page da, 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 and they'd turn to it and they'd be like, I haven't got that poem. And I'd go, oh, I forgot we're not allowed to do it. Or I'll have to take them back in. We're not, well, I'll have to do a different, we're not allowed to do it. And they'd be like, what do you mean we're not allowed to be like, the government won't let you read that poem. <laughs> and they would say like, I have to read that book. <laughs> like, just love it. It's like, oh, go on then. I was like, don't tell anyone we've done it. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, back to the actual question. So um, I did some mental health meetups at um, the Abbey House Museum using games. And they were really lovely. We used to get a, just a small group of people, but it was always really nice. And like, to be honest, we didn't always play loads of games we didn't always play the most complicated game you know sometimes we just play half a game of something but it was a nice vehicle for like I think you know picking up on what Liz was saying about feeling maybe a bit awkward it gives you like a focus doesn't it so it's like it's not like we're going to meet and we're going to talk really intensively about our mental health you know because that's just no one wants to come to that whereas if you say oh, we're just going to get together and play some games and I'll teach you the games then it, it's kind of like incidentally as you're playing the games you'd be like so how was your week or you know and you end up talking quite a lot and I think um certainly for for men as well it's quite a good way in because I think men I know it's a bit of a stereotype but generally talk less about their emotions and talk less and chat less and so I think for some of my events at some of the pubs I've done I've had like regulars who are male who will go to the pub on their own and perhaps ordinarily would have just sat at the bar and maybe not chatted to people but then they end up kind of chatting because they're playing a game together and it's just really nice um and I did a, a, a group like a, a scheme of work sort of a group of sessions on social um skills um at a special school that teaches children with autism and that was really successful that was really you know they really loved the games they really enjoyed them and that was to do with you know we did cooperative games where each person has their own skill that they have to use so it's all about you know being able to say oh I'm running out of water and someone saying oh it's okay I can carry extra water and so there's that 
you know, intermixing and, and acknowledging different skills in different people and then and also that resilience because a lot of cooperative games are incredibly hard. So, you know, we played Forbidden Island and we lost, but they were like, can we play it again next week? And I was like, yeah, of course, yeah, we'll, we'll play it till we win. <laughs> and we did, we did win. But it's kind of, it's that resilience, isn't it? That if you said, oh, we're going to do this maths problem until you get it right, that seems awful. But if you say we're going to play this game until we've beaten it, they're with you on it, you know. And I think it's a nice way to work on your resilience. So, yeah. I was going to also mention if we're talking about social interaction at the British Library we do have a secret staff board gaming club and one of the things I have been missing during the lockdowns is and in terms of kind of interacting it's meant that I've got to know colleagues in completely different departments who work on very very different things from me because they're fellow board gamers so I've got I've got great contact in our um, conferences catering team so if I need a favor I, sh I shouldn't probably out them in this but if I need a favor and and, and I'm organizing a conference or an event having someone who's an events manager who is my board gaming buddy from board gaming club it really helps and and so I think for kind of even bonding in the workplace um I'm quite naughty I pretend it's at lunchtime so it is at lunchtime but I'm like oh I'm off to a meeting and then like I'm down at board gaming club but it's brilliant and it's really kind of really helped me network especially if you're in a large organization so the BL is a large organization it's not always easy to get to know everyone so yeah just those kind of social interactions because a board game club really helps. I think just to pick up on that as well about like networking it's that kind of removal of the expectation isn't it if they said oh you know once a week at lunchtime you're going to network and you're going to meet lots of people from different departments it feels much more onerous whereas if you're just hanging out you do talk about work because that's where you are but it's not a not a structured thing is it which is good really um You've mentioned learning quite a lot in, in throughout the event today. Do you think that games can help people to understand difficult or serious topics as well? Um, Stella, do you want to go first with that one? Yep, absolutely. I was going to mention this whole genre is there's news games and serious games. Coventry University has a serious games institute. Um, there, there's companies that specialise in, in news games and serious games. I must admit, I don't know that much about it, but I've come across some good examples, some very thought provoking games. I was just going to mention Papers, Please, which again can be used on played on mobile devices where you play um, a, a border immigration official and you have to process people's papers but you've got time constraints and so you're constantly having to make very time sensitive decisions that that kind of affect people's lives and I, th I think games like that um, yeah j just gets people thinking about social issues and and eth ethical issues um, there's lots of these sorts of things I know there's science games as, as well um, there was one game look Looking at actually um, the shooting of J JFK and angles of where the shooter would need to be and whether the person, whether whether the person who was accused, whether it was feasible. Um, yeah, like I say, not my area, but I really do think there's an awful lot of scope for for games to tackle serious issues, um, and 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 it, it could also, I suppose, maybe even with taboo subjects or subjects that are hard to talk about. Um, that, there could be an opportunity for kind of serious games and news games. Um, I really do think um, looking at um, fake news and disinformation, um, anything that gets people critically thinking news sources, and if, if there's kind of ways, games to do this. Some newspapers are up on this. So Financial Times um, were in, uh, have been pretty interested in kind of um, games. So there are, yeah, I, th I think there's lots of opportunity. And, and like I say, the one I just wanted to kind of flag up was papers, please, for this. Great. Thank you, Stella. And um, Liz, you've put a link into chat. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more of your thoughts? Uh, to be honest, I think Stella's probably said everything there is to say about uh, news games. I've just put a link into the Uber game. Um, and it's just an example of uh, often the definition of a game is that it has a win state. And I'm not sure this one does. And that's kind of the point of it. So
So people are subverting the rules of games. I think, and I haven't watched your webinar yet, but I think you talk about rule breaking games, don't you? In one of your webinars for this series, I watched a bit of it this morning. Um, and uh, you know, the Uber game, I don't know whether you can actually manage to make the amount of money you need to make to pay your mortgage and go see your kids in the school play. You know, it's that sort of thing. So it's using interactive fiction and game-based mechanics to really help you realize once you're living that life, once you're immersed in the game, you know, actually this isn't fair. And sometimes making you participate in something can, can just give you that different viewpoint that makes you realize, uh, you know, what, what's going on. Um, so yeah, I recommend uh, news games. I, I put a link to a whole load of them in the um, chat. Can I respond to a question I've just seen in the chat? Is that okay um, about um, depression or sometimes difficult issues? Um, with Twine, so I've mentioned interactive fiction before, there's actually quite a lot of interactive fiction about depression um, and, and kind of other mental health. Um, in fact, there's a very famous work of interactive fiction um, called Depression Quest, and I put a link in. I hosted um, a, a project at the library collecting interactive fiction. And so this was Linda Clark. She is now at Dundee University. Um, but Linda spent six months at the British Library collecting interactive fiction in the UK web archive. She analysed the themes of the works that she collected. And depression was one of the themes of many of the works that were in there, um, along with, I think, what was it, tea and trains? So, but, but, some, but it was, it, so she did some analysis and did some pie charts about the themes of the works um but but I, I i do think as yes i mean handled sensitively but but certainly with works of interactive fiction i've seen quite a lot of writing about that um and it can be a useful way for people to express themselves same with kind of lgbtq plus issues um one of my collaborators wrote a blog post about works of interactive fiction um, written by um, trans writers. Um, again, we have a number of them in the collection that Linda um, built for us. Um, and, and so, yeah, certainly in the world of interactive fiction, the, these kind of topics are dealt with a lot. I'll put, try and put some things in. Liz, you're ahead of the game. Thanks for pasting that in for, for Depression um, Quest. Thanks. Yes, I, I suppose games are very much storytelling, so you can learn about other people's um, perspectives and experiences, and then you know maybe you're not alone, um, and other people have gone through what you're going through, and again, opening up a new social network for you, which I think is really important. Anne, have you got any examples of um, learning-based games on difficult subjects? Or... Yeah, I think I was going to echo what you just said, Karen, kind of what Stella said about storytelling games, because as soon as you're taking on a character, like in a book, you can explore things that are beyond your your sphere of experience, can't you, by, by inhabiting that character? So I think that's, that's true of a lot of storytelling games. Um, and just come back to what Liz said about games without a win condition, I had a really interesting conversation on Twitter again about... I just posted the question is it still a game if you can't win and there was like a bit of mm, no no it's not and I think traditionally we, we think no that's that's not a game but actually the more the more you discuss it the more you think actually why is that why do we expect to have a win and a lose where actually you could just be completing a set of objectives or completing an outcome so it's a really interesting question and one of the ones that I looked at in the early sessions that we did was called and then we died which is interesting because it deals with the topic of death and and so that's that's quite an interesting one and certainly in the in the notes that come with it it suggests that before you play you need to come to some sort of understanding in a group of how you're going to tackle the subject because obviously some people are quite flippant about it some quite light-hearted other people may feel that it's something that requires a serious response so you're creating a story about how you how you've died sort of thing but you can do it in all different ways and I think that's quite nice and that doesn't have a win condition the the outcome is that you work out what happened um and then the other one that I thought of when you were talking was um because Monopoly originally when you were saying about the Uber game Monopoly originally was a socialist game wasn't it and it was supposed to be played that to, to show the kind of evils of capitalism wasn't it and actually it, it's funny isn't it because everyone was like oh that's not very interesting let's make it capitalist because that's fun you know and that that's how it ended up being monopoly basically isn't it that it was more fun to play in that way so it's interesting isn't it because that 
that started off very differently. It's interesting how it went. And you wonder whether if that game came out now as a modern game, whether it would have ended up being capitalist or whether people would have been like, oh, fine with this being a socialist game and, and looking at the evils of capitalism. It's interesting. Um, and then the one that I was originally going to mention is called The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. And it's about it's it's um, about a man who's dying and he's got dementia and you have to kind of um, piece together his memories and you also have to resolve some of his kind of issues and things that have happened. I haven't played it when it came out. Um, both my parents died of dementia and when it came out, it was a little bit too close to the bone for me. Um, but certainly the things I've heard about it really resonate that idea that everything's settled. I remember going to see my dad and he wasn't kind of really conscious, but I remember me and my sister laughing because we've both been saying the same things to him, like everything's sorted. We've organized this, we've organized that. I've watered the garden, you know, kind of just silly things that you say to people to kind of, to make him feel settled, you know? And one of the things that we had both told him was, um, while he was poorly, they, they were doing work on the car parks, the car park was free. And my dad was always a big moaner about the cost of car parks. So we were both saying to him when we went in, I don't know what other people must have thought when they heard us, but we were going in going, car park was free, dad. I haven't, I haven't had to pay, brilliant. I stay as long as I like and it's free. <laughs> so we're thinking, fancy worrying about money when your dad's lying there. But because we knew he'd be pleased to hear it. So it's. I think at some point I'd love to play that game because I think it's interesting to me about how aware people are as they kind of slip away do you know what I mean so yeah so that's called the troubled life of Billy Kerr and I think that's again it's not a fun game by any means but it's an interesting game and it's it's playing about with ideas isn't it and yeah coming to a conclusion I, I wonder if that's got a win condition I don't know you've made me think Anne Northumbria University were doing a project with interactive jewellery with photographs that could trigger memories to work with people with dementia and Alzheimer's I, I haven't got a link on hand but I found this really interesting um, it, it was so not games as such but interactive jewellery with memory photogra photographs um, I went to an amazing talk about it a couple of years ago and it did kind of blow my mind because I wasn't expecting a, jewel a jewelry department to be involved in this sort of kind of memory um and and yeah memory work as well but um yeah all of these things sound super interesting well, Stella you did um something at the British Library that really inspired me you had a talk somebody came in to talk about how they used interactive fiction to as a process as a game making as a process to help them deal with things and my my dad sadly had dementia and I was looking after him we couldn't couldn't find a home for him so we took it in turns and he just kept coming in and saying the same thing going through the same process and I thought I feel like I'm trapped in like the forest from the hobbit or the maze from the original you know adventure game and I started writing it as interactive fiction so everything he did I documented and made this madly looping um thing in twine that just really helped me process what was what was going on and kind of made me walk his experience with him while I was documenting it and I've never published it or done anything with it that's not what it was for it was the process of finding out the rules of the game and the rules of his behavior that really helped me deal with it that's just I think that just sums up how powerful games can be and storytelling and I think that's probably why we do what we do isn't it and why we love games and stories and books so much is that you can kind of it's therapeutic and you can kind of go into these different worlds and kind of get a bit more understanding about the world around you um, if that's not too deep I don't know <laughs> um, so I think we're coming up to the end of our hour we've had a lot of people contact us um, asking for the recording um, so I think a lot of people who aren't here will be desperate to see this after we've published it um, but if anyone's got any questions that they want ask, to ask about the games that they're making for tomorrow please do um, but if not join our Facebook group we'll be answering questions we on that all weekend um, and join us tonight for our event with the Rosie Summers, our virtual reality event. Um, but yes, yeah, so any questions coming through? Quick look. I think there's just been so much to take in as always, um, but we've had such a fantastic hour and it's been so interesting. And um, yeah, it's just lovely to see all three of you as always. Um, 
So, was there any last questions you want to ask each other before we finish? No? We've exhausted all our game discussions. <laughs> I think we yes. can talk forever, to be honest. I know, I know. <laughs> it's a lovely way to spend a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, and the Stella says if we can save the chat, we can make sure we can put it up. Yes, we've got so many links in there, so we'll circulate all those and the playlist. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining us, and hopefully you'll submit some games for us. <laughs>